and take us in. This is Thursday, March 15th, 2018. Uh, we are Rex and uh, we are heading into a call and our custom for the start of calls is to have a poem or maybe two. I have two very short ones for us today. Um, hey, Kelly. Hey, Todd. Um, I have two very short poems for us today. And uh, the first one is titled Rice by Chun Yang He. And it goes as follows. To you who eat a lot of rice because you are lonely, to you who sleep a lot because you are bored, to you who cry a lot because you are sad, I write this down. Chew on your feelings that are cornered like you would chew on rice. Anyway, life is something that you need to digest. So to you who eat a lot of rice because you are lonely, to you who sleep a lot because you are bored, to you who cry a lot because you are sad, I write this down. Chew on your feelings that are cornered like you would chew on rice. Anyway, life is something that you need to digest. And the second poem is titled For a Moment by Ron Paget. It's funny how if you just let go of things, they will come to you. That is to say, sometimes. So what good is such a generalization? Uh, it makes you feel good to say such things from time to time as if you actually and really and truly knew something. So again, For a Moment by Ron Paget. It's funny how if you just let go of things, they will come to you. That is to say, sometimes. So what good is such a generalization? Uh, it makes you feel good to say such things from time to time as if you actually and really and truly knew something. <laughs> something about both poems captured the moment. I don't know what it is exactly, but uh, something took me there. Um, and our, our, our goal now in this call today is just to check in and see where we are and see what we're working on that feels uh, kind of Rexy. Uh, and, uh, so with that in mind, and I've got a couple items I'd love to check in about, but who would, uh, who would like to step in and just, uh, say where you are, how you are? Anybody? Jemay? Were you pointing to someone else or were you volunteering? Well, yes, I was pointing to whomever is to my my right on whichever screen you have but and uh, on my screen that is the margin there is nobody to you to that side of your figure so it was, it was a good try but all right that's why it looked like you raising your hand see for ah, my context right, right. um frustrated um uh unable to be shocked anymore uh the the thing that came out last night about uh, uh, 45 bragging that he was making stuff up in his conversation with Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. We have a trade deficit with you. No, you don't. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Um, it's just, it, it's sad, but not shocking. And I, I, I wish I could be shocked these days. I I, uh, I long for the days of being surprised by horrible things. Um, you know, unfortunately, the uh, what that means is that when I do get surprised by something horrible, it's going to be really fucking horrible. Mm -hmm. um, pardon my German. Because um, the uh, because the hurdle for surprise has gone up so much. Yeah. Um. That said, we've been having some rain in Northern California, and that's good. And um, my wife and I have been just getting along. We're like disgustingly still in love with each other, even after 30 years. So, um, Do you make the cats turn their heads? Uh, no, we make them watch. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to report you. Please. <laughs> um, let me know if you need photos for the report. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear um that's lovely no it's not it's horrible no uh, i mean the love part not the cat yeah. pornography part 
I said nothing about pornography. I it's know. I was inferring dirty so mind. much in the gutter, totally. Yep. Driven there by the Times. And I don't mean the newspaper. <laughs> the Financial Times. Um, so we live in a world where things are falling apart. So what do we do about it? Um, do we simply hope for the better? Do we start planning a revolution? Um, do we go out and do 17 minutes of protest? I, I'm not young enough to do that. I think you need to be a, uh, a Gen Z slash digital generation or uh, what is the, what is the, uh, the term? I, I, think it, I think it wraps around generation alpha. We're starting over again. Right? Um, the greatest generation Mark two, which if you, if you go by the Strauss and Howe model for generations, it actually would be the, the return of the greatest generation cohort. Hmm. Interesting. So, but I'll shut up now. No, that's all right. Oh, I was, I was going to say something which, huh, it's gone now. I think, I think well, uh, partly I was going to mention that, um, oh, I, I think I know. Um, I, I was a little surprised that there are apparently going to be talks between Trump and Kim, right? North Korea talks that showed up somehow. And there's a school of thought that looks at Trump and his methods as breaking so many norms and so many boundaries that in fact he's shaking things up and might lead to some interesting results. Um, that everybody else who would be minding the guardrails with great caution and making sure that they stay within the historic context of everything probably would not make a lot of progress on things. And I don't know. I, I, I'm as struck by how out of control and you know how the wheels seem to be coming, ready to come off at any moment. But, but <clears throat> what, what if everything needed to be shaken up a lot? Um, they're shaken up a lot. Depends on whether you leave the lid on when you right. shake something up a lot. Um, I think it's, it can be useful. To sh it probably was very useful to, be, to shake stuff up. Um, but to do so in a way that is um, beyond chaotic. You know, it, do so in a way that actually, yes, you can get a good mix occasionally, but you're also going to fling stuff all over the floor. And, and occasionally the pot might break. And that, that's one of the big dangers right now. Right. Yeah. Hey, Dave. Hey, Kevin. Uh, we're just going around checking in. Um, and would anybody else like to? Oh, go please, ahead. Jermaine. Somebody else. Please, somebody else. Please. Anybody? Todd, would you like to check in? Uh, you're still muted. There you go. Sure. Sure. Um. I'll tell you kind of what's what's weighing on me right now. Uh, you know, next year will mark 10 years since I left the world of employment and uh, tried to do business in the way that um, I had clients and not a boss. <laughs> uh, and it's been quite the the road of... Um, starting and running a business and understanding who I am and what I offer and how to communicate that. Uh, and right now, the question that I'm asking is that most of the world is in a problem solution mindset uh, that is uh, especially consultants don't get hired unless there's a problem to solve. Um, and if they want to hire you, then your job is finding the problem that you are going to solve. And I'm feeling that this is so um, not getting to the roots of the matter uh, uh, and exploring how we move towards possibilities rather than solving problems. So a move towards an aspiration, a vision, a possibility, rather than solving problems. Because the truth is, when you're solving one problem, it's always connected to a dozen, a hundred others. 
uh, and you're not making change at a systemic level. Um, so I am, I'm grappling with that, and it's a creative tension that I enjoy um, of stepping forward and saying, um, are there some possibilities that your organization wants to move towards rather than do you have a problem that you want to get solved? And the whole um, problem solving thing as a problem itself uh, from the people who do appreciative inquiry is, is, is easily applicable yes. to what you just said. It's like if you're trying to fix problems, that's in fact not a great way to go about what you're doing. Hmm. Yeah, many uh, sort of there's a, there's a global problem of perspective of how we're seeing ourselves, what we're seeing, how we're going about trying to fix what, what might be broken, how we're seeing what's broken. Uh, we're all over the map on that. Um, Esty, you have to, I think, take off the call uh, pretty soon. Why don't, would you mind checking in? And you are muted. I finally found the place where I wanted to write down problem solving versus possibilities. Ah. Uh, a, a, an under caffeinated uh, problem for sure. Um, <laughs> now that it's written, I'm happy to check in. Um, Pat, I really appreciate the way you framed that 10 X years post employment um, and possibilities versus problem solving. Um, uh, my check in is starts with. Um, uh, really grappling with that question of what, who are you in the world if you are not employed and what happens over time when your free agency status um, seeps into every corner of the way you live life and relate to time, etc. cetera. Um, I feel like I'm, um, I've had two kind of, lovely discoveries as daylight savings time of the year um, has begun to assert itself. One in each of the two sectors that I, I consider um, the places where I would like to leave a legacy if one ever gets to do that at all. And so one is on my work in the, I think the sphere that brings us together most directly in the, um, and recognizing that the work that I've been doing around mind and multi-minding and um, describing what is as opposed to the model under which we think we operate, which uh, causes, uh, is no longer useful. Um, I realize that what I'm about is, what this really is, is a new grammar of productivity. Hmm. And something about, I know this group appreciates that pop up to an, an, a new word and a new framing has been really powerful um, and uh, simplifies. And um, I'll just point briefly to the other um, people who've been on this journey know that I tend to say things from a woman's perspective because I think that me, I feel, I always feel like I'm representing, right? The, um, th that 50%. Um, and um, also um, try, I, I feel like I have a, a viewpoint um, from my involvement in Jewish life and Jewish learning, which are synonymous. Um, some sort of perspective about time frames. Um, I was talking to Pete Kaminsky yesterday and he was, we were talking about the Long Now Foundation and how they're explaining to someone how their mission is to get you to think in time frames of a thousand years, for instance. And I suddenly realized that yes, that, that's a little bit of part of what that does. Um, I love so how they write I, dates with five digits. Yes, and speaking in terms of centuries, you know, well, we're at, and now we are at the century mark in, um, in Judaism, or at the multi-century mark of hitting enlightenment. This is the way Jews you know, talk about history. And we're at, we're at the century mark of the Holocaust and the collapse of Europe in the last 
globalization um, uh, meltdown. Um, and I've gotten involved with a wonderful podcast and group of people called Judaism Unbound, which um, is just a delight to listen to. Two guys, you know, one in his mid forties, one in his uh, one one probably mid late forties, one mid late twenties, you know, having conversations and talking to other people. It's just a riot and um, uh, feeling uh, inspired to help them make the impact that people are wanting from them. So um, it feels like, uh, aside from everything we've said about Trump, which, or the administration, which I'll add my, my one check in there, I think that what we're experiencing now is precisely what people were afraid of when they said, don't normalize. I, I think that every, almost every day I'm like, what, why are you applying these pseudo the, 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 these, as if it's okay on any level, as if there's any logic here, as if, as, right, this is when, it, when we now know completely it is not. So that's, that's my checking. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, you're, you're representing from Brussels. Uh, is that, I, I assume that's where you are right now. How, what's in with you? In, in Belgium, Flanders, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel pretty okay um, to what Todd just said. There is a very nice post from five years ago, I think, by um, Gene Russell about imagine possible test and proof. I can't, f I mean, I can find back the link, but it doesn't seem to work at this moment. Uh, hmm. I'll try to drop the link in the thank you in the, in the chat box here. and then you can see if it works but there is a diagram in there and I can I, I copied the diagram in a word document so if I can do share screening then I can show it go for it screen. let's see desktop okay share screen uh, so this was the, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's working great. Yeah. So, it's astonishing when technology actually works for you. Yeah. So this is a nice representation, but then she pointed to this link where it's the same story, but this is the, the picture. And so Todd was talking about possibility here. But there is art in just before that on what is imaginable. And then science people want to check out what is testable and math people want to prove things. So there's would, a whole- Wouldn't science encompass hypothesis as part of its- Yes. Would, would, yes. Would, yes. Uh, yes, it's a testable hypothesis. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was what was going through my mind when Todd was checking in. And then I'm going to show something else. So, I mean, I left uh, em employment work two months ago. Um, but I'm still in parallel doing my stuff on, on art and whatever I'm doing. So, and I'm working on a project that is called Hot Dogs Tonight. It has nothing to, well, it has to do with hot dogs, but because you're talking so much about Trump over there. So I have this one for you. So this is another <laughs> basket. Nice. <clears throat> I like that. That says a lot. Um, does, it, does it need to be red though? Well, it can be. Um, so, but this is part of a, a body of work that I'm, I'm on and I'm not going to bore you with every detail, but it started with a with work from an American artist. You did say hot dogs tonight. <laughs> I was like, yeah, was, that, was that hot dogs? It's like, yeah, yes, I you did, did say hot dogs tonight. Hot dogs okay, tonight. I, I just kind of let that go thinking, well, maybe I didn't hear right. Uh, <laughs> so there are several stories I can confabulate after the facts about this. So, but when I was in the army in Belgium, when I was young, we had the military service, uh, um, um, obligatory. Mm -hmm. Compulsory, obligatory, yeah. Compul compulsory, and 
so every Thursday or so, there were hot dogs. And that was the best meal of the week. So <laughs> looking forward to hot dogs tonight. And this uh, story started with this picture from an American artist about Robert Gober. And it's a prison window. So, and I saw it in the Museum of Art in Brussels. It's an installation, so it's in real size. It's about three meters high, the window. And I like the colors of the sky, so I wanted to paint it. And so over time, and I'm not going to bore you with everything, but at a certain moment, I condensed the image to this. And then my teacher said, well, maybe you can put like stripes on it, like Keith Herring. And then I have a version of this somewhere where the bars are not bars, but are hot dogs. Um, so I can do a lot of things with this. Uh, so what, so, but the story is about, um, uh, what call, you call it the golden cage or whatever cage. Gilded cage? Uh, it, it's a, it's golden, mm -hmm. golden, golden cage or, um, and looking from inside and looking from outside inwards. And it has also to do with uh, the sort of surveillance from social media. So a lot of things I'm trying to say, but in essence, I condensed this window to, to this thing that is over here. Yeah, that's the essence of the window. And I can do all sorts of nice things with it. I can create textile out of it. Mm. Yes, essence. Um, and it has become a obsession. <laughs> so when it becomes an obsession, <laughs> then I have standardized the whole thing. So I know exactly what are the uh, proportions. It's like a font. You've, you've yes, it's like a font. Drawn, it up, then, drawn it up as a letter. Yeah, and then it gets like some things like that. And then I make imprints and monoprints and collages this is a big collage of 720 windows and it could become an app <laughs> it's an iphone or a world clock where you guys in san francisco are over here so you're nine hours not not today but normally you're nine hours uh, uh, behind so mm -hmm. this is 12 o'clock and this is london one hour before and this is jfk six hours before so it becomes a sort of code. And then I'm making these small sort of things, 20 by 20 centimeters that I can present together. And then somebody said, you should go full digital with this. So I have the prison window from the prisoner inside being surveilled by somebody and the one watching in the cell. Yeah. It's probably something that you guys can use in a, in the US these days? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It seems to somehow resonate. I don't know quite mm -hmm. why, but. It's like looking to freedom from behind bars. So that's what's uh, keeping me busy besides having three chickens now and uh, a sound system where I make soundscapes and a garden that I'm preparing for spring. That was my chicken. Lovely, thank you. Uh, is spring springing right now yet, or is it still no, a little it's, ways away? it's raining and they have forecasted some freezing, cold, windy, snow weather for the weekends. Got it. Uh, in Portland, this weekend was the beginning of spring. Whether we get a sn cold snap again or not, but the leaves, the, the, the blossoms are coming, the cherry trees are in full bloom, spring has sprung. Thank Peter. you, Peter. I might suggest that you take a look uh, because you, you've come up with a visual, repeatable theme, um, a visual mimetic, as it were, that you take a look at the uh, blue dog phenomenon because it's very similar, right? There's an artist that comes from uh, Louisiana where you know he's using this single repeatable visual thematic it was a dog that he owned right and the blue dog series became very popular right and so you may take some lessons from looking at what he did 
Uh, it can go all directions, of course. <laughs> nice. Is it T-shirt? Uh, also, um, the uh, Obey Giant uh, meme basically is is huge. So uh, you're you're very likely inspired by that. But but if you haven't looked into it, um, look at that because it's a it's basically a high contrast picture of Andre the Giant, <clears throat> and uh, uh, made its way as a as a very powerful meme worldwide. That gets stenciled all over the place. Uh, have you done stenciling? Have you got, gone out and done a little graffiti? I mean, you know, if you're going to try yes, all the media. So, the, so this this uh, thing, I also have versions of it that look like a, a tag. Mm -hmm. or Perfect. Like, um, That's right. You had a stencil in the middle there of what yeah, you were showing us. Uh, these things. Sweet. Yep. Uh, anyone else would like to check in? I'll check it in. Please. <laughs> uh, I have two boys who are 12 and 15 almost, which I'm like, oh my God, that's like pretty How'd old. that happen? Yeah. Right. Like that was, that took 15 minutes. And um, I have be gotten to a place where I'm like, the, the primary question is, am I okay today? Am I okay right here in my living room today? because of sort of all of the news that just keeps getting worse and worse that I just can't even believe because of the conversations that I have to be having with the kids, like because of sort of, um, I feel like I've gone very Buddhist in my sort of like, all I have to worry about right now is right now, which is sort of new for me. That's a different, um, that's a different approach than I've taken. And it, and it has made me feel or wonder if I'm being, terribly self-centered, right? There's too much going on in the world for me to only, you know, sort of check in with myself, but it has been um, really helpful. <laughs> it's been really, um, it has felt so good to be able to be present specifically for the kids, right? Through all of this total nonsense and to be able to talk to them about things without being completely triggered by my own fear nonsense. So those, there's been that piece. And at the same time, um, I work for a little not-for-profit think tank, um, and I've been there for seven years now. And the executive director is talking about retiring, which has brought up all kinds of interesting um, things. I mean, like, apparently this is a thing that you do when you get to be 67 or 68. You, it turns out you want to retire. And I think this is a horrible idea because he's also my dad and I really enjoy working <laughs> with him. And, um, and so that has also been a real opportunity um, to do some interesting work and self-reflection and, and am I okay right now? Um, in, and, and will it be okay? Because there's a really interesting this is the first time I've gotten a little choked up about it in a little while. Um, what has come up for me um, is that if, if in fact the organization, which I treasure and I think is an amazing group of people that's been built over the last 25 years, and I, ha and I get to be sort of part of the community binder in that, um, if it's okay without him, right, does that make me disloyal? Which is mm. not something that I would ever think about um, like that took a lot of sort of working through to figure out that that was what was going on for me. So, so there, I feel like there's just been a ton of stuff that's very close to my heart while also the world appears to be sort of burning, but it's not burning in my living room. So I'm okay right now. <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm at these days. That's, that was, that's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> and I, 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 I don't have kids, <clears throat> but I, I oscillate between wishing I was 12 or 14 again, because what I had at my fingertips when I was 12 or 14, it was nothing compared to what's out there now. And the, the access and the power and the, the magnification and the, everything, the leverage you have, is just insane if you're sort of awake and curious and go, go find stuff. And uh, you know the ability to connect with other people. Uh, and then at the same instant, like, or like I'll flip then into the mode of, I, I don't envy any parent of a child these days, not from the conversations you have to have, 
not from the fear you might have. And anybody who is of color and going outside, I, I, had, a, I had a moment a couple of years ago when Black Lives Matter was, was big. I had a moment where I was like, I'm going to go drive to the grocery store. And, and it flashed through my head that I'm not concerned that getting in my car and driving over to the grocery store, I might get pulled over for a broken taillight and shot and killed. I don't have that concern. And yet there's a bunch of people who do, and very justifiably. And you can say what you want about the statistics about it, but this is a longstanding concern. Um, so it's hard to exist in a world like that. And maybe, you know what? This is all a false flag operation by the Buddhists. This is basic, basically Trump's election, all these other things are a way to get more people to become Buddhists because it's the only way to cope with, well, you can also go for deeper into fundamentalism, I guess. There is that. That sort of does exacerbate things. But then, you know, you choose a camp and you just go, go, go. But, but maybe this is all a way to get more people who can cope with severe whiplashing kind of change. Man. Um, Kevin, what's up in your world? Well, and I, I'm perhaps my perspective is a little bit, you know, different. I, I'm kind of enjoying the destruction of complacency right now. Um, the uh, fact is that we're we're ridding ourselves as as Toolman, you know, said, we're ridding ourselves of unjustified assumptions, right, about you know what is possible. Um, both positive and negative, right, at the moment. So there's a bunch of built-up potential energy that is being um, released kinetically now, right, because people are being forced to being their own journalists, to being their own fact-finders, to being their own, you know, uh, ability to sort through this. Um, you know, the ability to delegate to other people is being revoked. Right. And so this actually puts us back into a form of representative democracy where we have to represent ourselves a little bit more, you know, forcefully. I, I think that the, you know, the, the reaction to current events is actually going to be pretty interesting. It's, it's hard in the moment, but I'm very, you know, interested in what the opposite reaction is going to be in the not too distant future, right? So that's where I'm coming from. I'm seeing a whole bunch of things that are, uh, you know, were new hypotheses and new ways of, of seeing things, all right, that we wouldn't have imagined a couple of years ago are about to become possible. And so you know, I thrive on this kind of stuff. Um, so it's actually a kind of a, an interesting period. Um, I don't know if any, any guys watch any of these uh, Highlander movies, right? But there's a, there's a group of people who aren't trying to destroy each other to become the one, right? They're called the observers, all right? And I feel like I am in the best place to be one of the observers, right, that I've ever had in my entire life. So enjoy being in the Highlander movie, but... <laughs> You know, it's a great mm -hmm. time to be an observer. Super interesting. Yeah. And it's hard because the whole, the whole notion of observing or witnessing uh, is part of, what, of the action. It's very hard to step outside the action now because everybody's kind of connected and everybody's involved. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can preserve equanimity while watching, you may come up with a better strategy for solving the whole thing, which is a great way to, you know, to be an observer. Yeah, um, I mean, and, yet, and yet the mere act of observing is, is hard. Well, I mean, the, you know, like quantum physics, observing puts you into the action, right? It causes, you know, by observing things change, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I recognize that in the act of observing, I'm, I'm also changing some things. Um, you know, I've, I've found a lot of solace in, you know, um, writing of the people who, you know, are in the behavioral economics camps and the, you know, social psychology camps, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're all saying, you know, you need to be able to step into other perspectives. Mm -hmm. 
Bill, that, you've just joined us. I think we're getting some background noise from your, your mic. It's, the, it's like the, uh, the, the mice from planet Mars have joined us. Yes, exactly. I just muted Bill's um, <laughs> mic for a second. Bill, if you want to join in, unmute and, and uh, please do join us. We're, we're busy checking in, going around. There we go. So uh, I think that's that, that's kind of it for you know for me. I mean, I get as distressed as anyone, all right, um, in the, you know from time to time. But then I try to pull back and kind of do a Marshall McLuhan and say, well, you know, the the medium that is being delivered is is a message too. Bill, we can't hear you. Um, we're, we're, yeah, we, we don't we don't actually hear your voice. You sound like a gerbil that's being squeezed through a spaghetti machine. <laughs> yeah, no, not not better, not better. Now we see your ceiling. There you are. You are. It is it, it is actually you speaking, but we don't hear a thing. We, who gave him helium and sped him up? Oh, totally, totally. It sounds, <laughs> <laughs> I love this effect, though. I know. Yeah, no, you still, you, you still sound like a gerbil on on, on amphetamines. It's definitely a I think yeah. I saw this on an episode of The Outer Limits, right? <laughs> you well, know? you might need to log out and log back in, which is, I think, what you're doing now. Good. We control Ooh. the horizontal. We God, that was funny. Kelly, keep it together. Keep it together. Yeah, there was, wasn't there an episode of Star Trek where they got sped up and they were eating their lifespan too fast? Yes. And yeah, Kirk, got awesome. actually, Kirk got sped up to help them out. And it turns out exactly. course, he falls in love with a fast-moving woman. And <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be a good song about this, too. Yes. Is this any better? Oh, my gosh. We can hear you now, Bill. <laughs> That is exactly what you sounded like to us. It was really great. Okay. Um, but now you sound normal. Do, would you, uh, and you've missed a, a bunch of check-ins. That's what we're doing. We're going around and, and uh, checking in with everybody. Uh, yeah. Let me t turn to Dave for, for a moment so you can match rhythm with us, and then we'll, we'll go to you. Uh, yeah, it's fun. It's, it's fun just to kind of hear from everybody. The, uh, I, I was resonating with the, the kids' story because I've got – my two college age boys have just shown up in town this week. So it changes the, changes the tempo of the apartment a little bit when you add their energy. So, uh, but it's fun, right? I kind of, I'm, you know, I, I, I think I'm on the, I'm jealous of them side. Not, 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 you know, not so and they're much. really, really out in the world now. Like they're, they're doing stuff. Yeah. yeah one of them's supposed to graduate from college this uh, in June. We'll see, see what happens then. And the other one, of course, is, you know, flying around from country to country so it's uh it is fascinating to and then fascinating to watch them interact too because they're quite different so so it's a treat uh, and then also just resonating with, with what you were saying todd because it's definitely um, you know the transition for me from from thinking about problems to thinking about possibilities has been really kind of important you know it's like a, it's been a way to um you know kind of feel like the world's got got potential and is worth kind of fighting the way through. So I don't think I've quite gotten to the equanimity of, of Kevin yet. But uh, uh, so the, the question is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you, like for me, it's, it's like, how do I do even kind of small initiatives that I consider to be pra pra uh, progress? How do I make you know, contributions, you know, get, get traction on stuff? And um, this week the topic has been, uh, so, you know, been very excited about regeneration and regenerative agriculture and how do we think about kind of large scale systems changes. And the one of the, you know, the focus has been then, well, to, to kind of a landscape or a community basis, like if you're going to be doing these systems changes, they're kind of going to happen <laughs> in a place because it doesn't help to do change one part of the system in one place and one part of the system in another place. They don't interact. Um, and so the question that we were talking about this week is, is an issue of like simultaneity. Do you need many things to happen at the same time? How do you tee that up kind of in a practical sense? And particularly from an investment perspective, how do you get investors to think about simultaneous investments in multiple parts of the system, you know, that are coordinated enough that they can be reinforcing? And is that a, you know, in some sense, is that a saleable product you can make in the social impact investing world where you could go to a, 
a Rockefeller and say, look, if you're going to invest your endowment, you need to make sure that you're doing it in a simultaneous way so that you can get higher returns and more certainty. But, you know, those are the kinds of things that have been, you know, in, in, in play in my world right now. Dave, I have a question. How did your, your work with regenerative tie into what Hodge is doing and what Jones is doing with Regenicon. Do, do they do they connect? Are you cooperating or collaborating? I'm I'm a little bit kind of in the weeds about how they you know interact with each other. Yeah. So so my stuff, the re, you know, like thinking about regenerative agriculture has been kind of just to like I need to focus on something, and that spawned directly from uh, a conversation that Hodgson started. So, you know, the, the concept of, of RASA, the Regenerative Agriculture Sector Accelerator, was like the Google Docs folder name that Hodgson came up with. Kind of. Okay. Um, and then um, Kevin, I'm not, I'm not particularly well tied in with Kevin. I know Mark Brosh a, a little bit, so I've been meeting with Mark kind of regularly. Mark's helping with the event. So there's a, I don't know if you guys know this, there's a, a regenerative economics conference that Kevin Jones is going to be hosting at the Impact Hub in San Francisco in the beginning of May. And um, it, I'm kind of excited by it because it does seem like one of those kind of, you know, it's another sign that the concepts are getting more traction. Um, and so Kevin's, you know, I think maybe in his own style, discovering it as he goes. So uh, he doesn't seem particularly sophisticated in the thinking of this stuff. I mean, you know, I, I like come looking back and going, oh, you know, Gene Russell was talking about this stuff years ago and I never got it. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's there's a little bit of history to it. I'm just kind of catching on. He's like, you know, two years behind me. So that's, that's not a good place to be. Um, but, um, but they all kind of interrelate. And then he is taking more of a, you know, people are taking kind of narrow and, and broader views. And I'd say he's at the society level. Kind of how do you think about a regenerative world? And so it's interesting to see, you know, we've been trying to focus on agriculture a little bit just because there's a lot of cool examples, but you know, you really don't get to do agriculture without changes around agriculture. Um, so the society stuff turns out to be very interesting as well. Thanks. Thanks for trying to, to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah if, you should, if you get a chance, come out for the event. I think. It's, I, uh, well, I was invited, but I'm in Japan at the time, and I'm. Um, <coughs> I'll be. Uh, I'll be out in your neck of the woods. I got invited to something the Institute for the Future is doing in April, so maybe we can tag up then. I would love that. Yeah, it'd be fun. And I still haven't uh, caught up with you, with you, honey. So. It's like, you know, the San Francisco crowd needs to have a cocktail party or something. Okay. Kevin, what, do you remember what it is in, at IFTF that you're doing in April? Uh, yeah, let me just, uh, it, it's a, it, it's part of the roadmap that you guys came up with recently. And this is kind of the future of work and befriending the machines um, okay. roundtable. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, is is it? I'm going to pronounce the name wrong. Par Parminder. Mm -hmm. Is that Parminder the right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct pronunciation. Um, she invited me via Daria Lamb, which was an introduction that you made, Jerry. So thank you very much. Cool, 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 cool. Glad you're part of that. Um, Bill, now that you don't sound like a dribble being mangled, uh, do you want to check in? <laughs> okay. Although I got to say the dribble impression the dribble is really thing good. So you need, I mean, maybe if that was my check-in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm feeling I'm very dribble. much like a squeezed dribble today. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting that you're asking us to sort of like focus on, on how we're approaching these things. There are two things that are sort of like center in, in my thinking on this right now. One is that we we went from about three years ago to having like 28 shareholders to the point where now I'm the major shareholder of our company and I'm in the process of buying out it, hopefully all of the other shareholders in the next hopefully month or so. And specifically around the question of what's the point of the company? In other words, they're all investors who came to this from the point of view of I want to make money. And from the get-go, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I had in our Articles of Incorporation the socially responsible investing concepts, in other words, respect of the environment, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. So they can't knock me for being social impact oriented. And in essence, because we use social impact as a marketing thing, it has become sort of like a tension 
with them that I'm spending so much money literally giving away like a million dollars a year and in their mind that's their money and I'm saying no it's marketing <laughs> and so it, it's like you I mean I literally had to write them a letter saying here's an offer to buy you out because I can't do both I can't do social impact and maximize earnings for you I just I don't wake up in the morning wanting to do that or willing to do that and excuse me according to our shareholders agreement with more than 60% of the stock, I make all the decisions. So thanks, but here's, here's some money, go away. Now and at I the same- I, I forget how you're organized. Are you a B Corp or a, for benefit just, now? No, it's a C Corp because it was before B Corps really yeah. existed uh, yeah. when we started this operation. Okay. But, but on the other hand, the, the thing that I'm, I'm sort of dealing with with some coaching and everything, is the impact of one's own focus. You, we, we've all heard that phrase, you don't see what is, you see what you are in the world. And I've been toying with, in other words, practicing that in the sense of taking the exact same situations and changing my perspective and, and then looking at it again. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like you're seeing that in action. You know, that your attitude, your focus, what you're looking at, what, how you're interpreting it, all of that shifts when you change, in a way, who you are looking at that particular event or circumstance. In other words, I didn't want to make any of my shareholders wrong. I didn't want to, because it was really getting kind of tense for a little bit, and then I sort of backed off and said, no, I'm not going to go that way. Um, but my point is that it... it got me to the point where I was, I was actually able to play with that perspective shifting aspect and not, not sort of start from the point of view of I'm right, you're wrong, or this is the way it should be and that's the way it is. You know, no, it's just, it keeps shifting. So I'm, I'm, I'm in a very fluid situation at this point. And all these issues that you listed, trust, institutional change, social movements, Human dynamics. I mean, in other words, those those are front and center. I mean, we're working with the with the um, uh, League of Women Voters that that has been asked to lead a Miami Beach Women's March next week, uh, and and they're they're pushing for this sort of creation of institutional change around women focus. You know, in other words, in the social movement for the, the Parkland School, etc. In other words, all of this stuff is seems to be bubbling up with a change of perspective approach. In other words, we're not going to focus on, you know, in essence, what are the impediments? No, this is what we want, and you're going to give it to us. In other words, we're going to find a way to get what we want. And to me, that's a beautiful, beautiful experience with the millennials that they're willing to commit themselves to that and not back down. And I'm, I'm really sort of hopeful that they're going to succeed at that, you know, sort of break the, the, the dam that has been creating that intransigence. I'm hoping too. Yeah. I'm wondering what we might do to, to help them achieve that. I don't know. Um, your, your, what you were just saying made me think of um, one approach to getting people to see their choices differently, which is, and I've not gone through it or read the books, but Byron Katie uh, is well known for the work. Right, and there, true. And there are four questions that she says you ask yourself. The first one is, is it true? This thing, this thing that you're facing, is it true? Number two is, can you absolutely know that it's true? which is really interesting. It takes the whole, the whole question to a new depth. The third question is, how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? How, what is your response to it? And number four is, who would you be without that thought? Mm -hmm. And these are really profound questions. I mean, these, these questions will take you right down deep into um, what you were just talking about, Bill, which is how you're seeing any particular situation. They don't, they don't, cause you to step out and try to take someone else's perspective. I don't think that's part of, part of her work. Although, uh, Kelly, is, is that part of what happens? Well, so then after you do the four questions, um, they, she has what's called the turnarounds. 
And so mm. you, you take your original statement and then you turn it around to the perspective of the other, to the opposite and to the self. And, oh, wow. and so it's a, I have, this is actually how I've done a lot of the work around my dad's retirement is through the work, right? And it's a really interesting, just sort of um, having the opportunity to say, this is sort of the belief that I'm holding. And then you examine it with these four questions and then you do the turnarounds. It really does allow you to put some different perspective um, in play, right? So the turnarounds, the idea is you turn around the statement and then you try to think of a way in which that's true. And, and it doesn't, it, she is not imposing, you know, any sort of um, change upon you, right? She's not, you don't do this work with the like, man, I really have to change my mind about this. It really just creates a tiny bit of space in which to think about it differently. Mm -hmm. I have found it just absolutely, I mean, really kind of life-changing. I'm a huge fan. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan, but I've not done the work, so to speak, um, or read the books or, or gone deep into it. But it seems like a hugely valuable model. Um, and that reminds me of nonviolent communication, which has as its process model um, that two people in opposition basically um, are asked to paraphrase what the other said. That, that's basically the whole exercise is the two people sit down, one person speaks and says what, what is happening for them, and then the other person is asked to mirror back to them what they said without agreeing to it, right? That's the contingency is that um, they, they're not saying, I agree that, that this happened. They're just trying to say, this is what I heard you say. Am I right, right? Um, and that's, that's um, super interesting because the mere act of speaking and having to put your head into the other person's head and say what they said in a way that they'll agree that that's what they said causes some of that softening and some of that change, right? And that brings me to a TEDx talk by a hostage negotiator, I think Chris Voss, who says, um, the, the, the moment that the person, that the person you're, you're negotiating with says, uh, that's right, you're, you, you're, you're, you have an opening because you've just said something that they hear you see their perspective, right? Um, which which um, takes me over into my check-in actually, strangely enough. Um, and uh, Bill, are you, uh, were you done checking in? With what? Uh, were you done checking in? Um, I'd, I'd just like to comment about the, um, the work. And it, it's sort of interesting. I've, I've sort of resisted doing the work to an extent because, the, I don't know, it's a personal thing watching uh, Byron Katie is, is, I mean, she's, she's so in, in almost a way arrogant about her way of doing this. In other words, is that right? You know, like, like she knows what's right. And there's a, I have a really deep seated problem of error being wrong. <laughs> so when somebody asks me that it's, it's difficult, but I happen to have signed up for a journaling thing with the daily ohm and the lesson number one was what they call revisioning your life. Now it's essentially the same thing as Byron Katie, but they just say, take a difficult event and, feel it with your emotions, and then choose and write out a new version from where you are now standing. In other words, forget about the past, you know, what caused that particular problem, and just write out a new version. Now, in, in essence, that's the same thing that Byron Katie is asking, is that old perspective true? And, but, but this approach gave me a way to get at it, and I ended up writing out a description of the the process that that worked in other words it gave me a totally totally new perspective that allowed me to let go of that past perspective of, of hurt you know of, of holding on to the hurt rather than letting go of it but but it's essentially the same thing as Byron Katie's you know because you're 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 forcing yourself to see that there's more than just that thing that you're holding on to I was hurt and therefore I'm entitled to hold that hurt you know, it's like, right. <laughs> but but that's, that's sort of like, there's one other thing that I want to just post, by the way, because it's a wonderful book. There's a book called The Scientification of Love by Michael Odent. Has hmm. anybody ever heard of him? Apparently, 
he was the one that came up with like water birthing, in other words, birthing in a bathtub or a, a hot tub or whatever. In other words, it, it's, it's really a very, very deep uh, analysis of the natural way that birthing should occur. And I don't, I don't want to make our job as relationship oriented too deep, but basically he says that we've got to go back to birthing people the right way, the natural way, or we're going to continuously, I mean, they've literally done that back in the 1970s, and I think that we're going to try to do a documentary on this. There was significant work by the doc, the, uh, the Department of Health, the, the um, NIH, which, you know, in other words, that, that does the funding for health initiatives and everything, um, it, that came up with a criticism. It was a worldwide analysis of birthing methods and the impact on social fabric and everything. And they found that there was a higher level of violence in those countries where there was a less natural birthing process. And our birthing process in the United States is extremely mechanical. In other words, all these doctors around fear of this, ultrasounds of that, 50%, you know, uh, cesareans. I mean, we've got a, an aggressive process, which they basically are, are, were saying back in the 70s, and then they took this report and put it in the bottom drawer and didn't want anybody to see it, apparently. And, and in, in essence, we're criticizing our fear creation at the time of birth. And we wonder why we've got such, such a violent culture. We're creating it from birth. Mm -hmm. And don't realize it. There's a whole series of institutionalized kinds of violence and trauma that we don't recognize because we've normalized them. We've, we've, right. We call them culture. Um, right. And they, they affect us right from the start yeah. in many ways. And our point in doing a documentary is it's sort of like a documentary that you are on dirt or, you know, in other words, they, they, you get to a basic level of, do you guys realize what, what you're doing with monoculture? Do you realize what you're doing with the birthing, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Kelly, you wanted to jump in. Just, uh, I, it, I was having a violently visceral reaction um, in the, with the thought of a male doctor really telling people how birth should go. Um, because I, my, my suspicion, I had a water birth. I gave birth in the tub the first time and couldn't the second time because uh, I was having terrible back labor. Um, and I couldn't, like I had to have people's hands on my backs and they couldn't, they couldn't reach me in the tub. But the, my whole perspective on this is all about removing any kind of agency from the mother, right? The actual person giving birth whose body has been basically designed to do it, <laughs> the whole removal of let us go ahead and tell you how you're going to do this makes me insane. So it, I, th I think it's a fascinating and the, and, and parenting outcomes, right? Mothering outcomes and postpartum depression and all of this are hugely impacted by the experience that the woman has while she's giving birth. So if you take all of her agency away, then she's like, why? I don't know, right? Like I was very lucky in that I came out of that and I was like, I am a badass, right? Like my body, like it has completely met all of my expectations. Like this was amazing. I had nothing to do with it. I can't even believe the system works. It's, it's an absolutely miraculous situation that we are able to create people at all. Like, and it, I can't even imagine the, the experience of having that be like, no, 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 you can't, don't trust your body. Trust me. Like I know, like, anyway, it was a hugely life-changing, obviously experience. And I think it has profound implications. Love that. Absolutely love that. A, a girlfriend long, long ago uh, pointed me to our critique of the Lamaze method as a way of hypnotizing the birthing couple out of the process. Basically, wow. make, them, make them focus on breathing, make them focus on one thing in particular, and then you don't have to worry about them. Look. So that's an interesting take on that. Right, yeah. because it's like, I'm sort of like, or it's a helpful tool in which right. you get to stay present with your own experience. I don't, I don't, know. I don't, I don't know which, but it was, yeah. a, it, was an, it was an interesting critique because, because in some sense, uh, it behooves the medical establishment to ha you know, give the couple something that oh, has yeah. them feel like they're participating and yet not be a problem. Yeah. Uh, also, um, an old colleague of mine from the days at New Science Associates, um, when his wife gave birth, they were in the hospital, uh, the baby comes out and he says, oh, can, you know, I'd like to hold her. And he gets the baby and then they're like, oh, we need the baby now. We're going to do this and this and this. And he's like, no, you're not. And they're like, no, no, and no, it, but we, ha but yeah, we have to. Yeah, throws him into no. a straight tizzy. 
Yeah. Right. He like, says, no, 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 you don't get to. And they went into a straight tizzy. He was recounting the story. It's very interesting how the establishment has a, has a routine that it needs to, needs to do. Okay, but just a footnote to that, Jerry. Th this book basically says that the father shouldn't even be in the room. Interesting. You know, in other words, the, 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 you really need to respect nature and the fact that that, that woman <laughs> does know what she's doing. Well, and Kelly's about right. to, her head is about to start spinning. Right. It's just like the father shouldn't be in the room if what he's going to do is scream and faint. Yes, yeah. that is true. Yeah. Right. Like, but how, but the father needed to be in my room. Like I needed him. He took, uh, this is a story for another time. Cause I actually have to go, but like he told, this is how I got through. It was, he just told me stories the whole time. Like I was like, talk to me. Right. I can imagine a scenario in which that's not helpful, but the, the part where you get to choose. Right. And, and some structure around, here's what might be helpful would certainly be right. Like here are the things to consider as you're going into this fairly traumatic process is great. But I, I really bristle at the, that, which is natural, right? Because we're like, I'm not going to go to a cave like, and so you have this huge spectrum of like, I was very lucky that I got to have two natural births, like, and, I got to totally have them on my terms and I did it at a birth center and I, right. Like so lucky. And also my friends who didn't have that were also very lucky that they had medical intervention, right. But that they had the education and the, and the resources and the wherewithal to kind of know what their options are, I think is, has just is huge. There's a lot about this, about agency. Yeah. And, and about how a lot of our social institutions take away agency for right. a, a variety of reasons, good and bad, yeah. and about how having agency is a usually, I can think of very few examples where it's not a really great thing, where where that actually solves a lot of other problems, right? Um, so um, let me let me check in before we actually run out of our, our call time, um, and partly I, I'm at. We're, we're at this very weird plastic moment in history. Um, and it seems like everybody got connected, like, like half the globe is on, like not only sort of on the intertubes, but sharing out their, their most passionate personal things on things like Facebook and Snapchat and whatever. Um, it seems like the social contract and the governance mechanisms are up for negotiation. Like nobody's clear what works, what doesn't, uh, where everything goes, um, how it all works. And I've got a couple of different projects that are sort of like meaty, chewy, right in the middle of these questions kinds of projects. So I wanted to describe those briefly uh, and come back to this um, because, you know, the, the historic argument kind of polarizes these different choices. Oh, it's, you know, it's either communism, which look didn't work or full on full blooded uh, capitalism, which of course goes hand in hand with democracy. And it's like, well, I'm unclear that capitalism is even friendly to democracy. I think it likes to have democracy because it looks good, but I'm, I'm unclear that those two things go together, you know, hand in glove, like, like they're described to us. So, so a couple things, um, and, and anybody who'd like to sort of offer advice or, or counsel or, or jump in on helping do any of these things, please contact me on the list or separately, and, and I'd, love, I'd love some help. But one is um, I have, uh, I've been given one uh, a keynote spot at PDF, the Personal Democracy Forum, which is coming up pretty soon in June, uh, close to mid-June. And um, they're changing the format for PDF this year. It, it's historically like the last seven years have been lots and lots and lots of panels where every year they have like 120 moving parts called, called panelists and they just go wham, wham, wham. And, and some of the speeches are quite memorable, but it's speeches and panels, speeches and panels. They've decided this year to experiment differently. They're doing 12 keynotes, which are 15 minute presentations plus 15 minutes Q and A with the audience in plenary. And then every keynote runs a workshop in the afternoon that's 90 minutes. Um, and I'm going to go into trust and I'm going to go into talking about how did trust break? How are we trying to um, recapture it? Um, I've got a wall full of post-its uh, off close by here, which is sort of my brainstorming so far and, and would love to go deeper into that. So, so contact me if you, if you want to come back. But, but part of uh, brainstorming that made me do some thinking about the moment we're in right now. 
and, and how do I generalize up from the moment we're in? And it's, it's strictly my generalizations because there's clearly a whole school of thought that's saying, hey, things are getting better. Like, like the world has never been this good. Look at the stats. And, you know, Bill Gates' favorite book is uh, Stephen Pinker's latest about how the world is getting better. And I, I'm sort of not buying what they're selling. I think it's important to address that point of view and, and, and go deeper into it. But I don't want to digress there. I think that we're at this very strange cusp that's potentially dysfunctional for a, a couple centuries. You know, back to this thinking in centuries thing. Um, that you know, the, 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 the story many of us tell is when Gutenberg and others kind of invent the printing press for 200 years, the church sort of monopolizes it and turns it into a way to create uh, Bibles and indulgences. And then for the next 200 years, uh, there's wars all across Europe because people figure out, no, 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 it's good for other stuff too, and look. Um, so that's 400 years of, of basically chaos um, from the invention of, of that thing. So w where are we now? Um, the second thing is uh, I'm working with Salim Ismail, uh, who wrote Exponential Organizations, and uh, working with him on uh, something which um, he's, he's kind of on a quest to fix civilization. So I'm trying to, to design a workshop process that might tackle difficult uh, domains, like learning is the, the pilot domain, but imagine we would also do um, governance, or we would also do uh, uh, aging or whatever else, uh, and try to figure out a repeatable um, process to tackle these issues uh, and get some results, like do some interesting work. And, and the exponential people are all about exponential technologies and change. Um, I find that uh, a bit of a limiting perspective, so I'm adding a bunch of things. And one of the things I'm adding to the process is I'm inventing a role I call story threaders. And a story threader is a bit like a graphic facilitator. And, and um, we've probably all been in meetings where somebody's drawing on a big piece of paper on the wall. Um, uh, Jemay, you and I know some of the world's best graphic facilitators uh, through, you know, through IFTF and other sorts of things. And I've always found uh, that even the best of them, they do something that's really interesting. Uh, and yet, effectively, the, 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 the things they create are very seldom referred back to. They're not <clears throat> digital they're not useful artifacts in the long run. So I'm trying to think, how do I help, in, how do I help midwife uh, a, a new way of creating useful materials during and after a meeting? And so I created a description for these story threaders. And I, I, I was thinking of story weavers as well, but I went with threading instead of weaving. Could go either way. Um, and the notion is I'm going to invite people who are really creative in completely different domains uh, and give them uh, as much leeway of action and, and sort of freedom of motion and artistic license as I can create in the space and ask them to look for the shiny nuggets in the event, in the conversation, uh, to intervene if they need to or want to, and then to take some time after the event and to craft some story from what they saw, to thread together the nuggets, to basically uh, string together the, the interesting points and create a point of view. And it might be their point of view. It might be one they heard and want to represent. They might go back to some of the speakers in the event and sort of interview them, whatever. And then they might create a card deck or a game or a video or a documentary or a super game like Jane McGonigal does or, or, or. Um, the notion being that some of these things go viral and cause a lot of change. Um, a, a terrible example is Coney 2012, right? Remember back in 2012, uh, there's this warlord loose. His name is Coney. And, and, and the magic of Coney 2012 is that the video says, hey, kids, bring your parents to see this and send us money, <laughs> right? And there's this horrible thing going on. And not, not, it wasn't accurate, but, but it had this magical little loop <coughs> that way predates the ice bucket challenge that generated a whole bunch of cash for, for, for a donation for a charity and got a lot of attention on a problem, even if it did so poorly. So how, so how do we create more functional models for change, make them open and put them in the world? And then how do we do this in a way that ratchets up so that every time there's one of these events, um, it creates materials that then are the platform that the next one and other sorts of initiatives can use to leverage up. Um, and I, I use here as the, uh, as the model. Um, uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, I use here as the, as the model um, Wikipedia, which unfortunately is just an encyclopedia, right? So, they, so fortunately, they're an encyclopedia, which gave them a mental model for what to do. 
But unfortunately, they're just an encyclopedia, which means there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen with and around it or beyond it that they don't do. Um, for example, years ago, I wish that, you know, that we had a, a grassroots set of uh, business sector uh, briefing books uh, so that if I had to go look at something in retail or something in transportation, I could just go look at, a, at this briefing book and get a really good snapshot of what's going on in that world. And that's not a task Wikipedia is going to undertake, but it's certainly a task that somebody could collectively create as a resource, which would be super interesting. Um, so um, story threader is one thing I'm trying to bring to this process, but I'm trying also to design other things into the process to invite with care, to convene with care, and I'm, I'm, all those things are, are up for design. So if you'd like to um, know more about that or participate, let me know. And then some of the things I'm talking about I will bring into uh, uh, into Rex in different ways. Um, and then uh, I'm interested also in making Rex Rexier, which um, has been my quest for you know a long time. But um, I've got some ideas on what that actually might mean at this point, which uh, I think I will bring up uh, in a in a future Rex call. But um, one of the pieces that, uh, that is standing out here, and this cuts across all the different things I'm talking about, but it came up in a really cool conversation yesterday with the Salim group, was how to reach out to the other, other with a capital O, whatever that means to each of us, um, and how to bridge the cultural divide, how to talk to people who are very different from you, how to find some sort of unity or, or, or or agreement on what's going on. And we, we've touched a little bit on, uh, on this during our conversation here. Um, but I'm struck by a couple of different things, a couple of different chunks of media, which I'll just mention here. One is, um, uh, have you all watched any talks by Anand Giridharadas? He's a guy, he's got so like salt and pepper gray hair that almost stands up straight. Uh, he speaks very eloquently. He's also a very good writer. Uh, he wrote, um, uh, he wrote a piece, I think, for the New Yorker years ago about a prisoner and his victim that got, got him sort of attention. But he wrote a, an apology letter in 2016, which he read as a TEDx talk. And it's an apology to those who have been, who have been hurt, who have suffered. Um, and it's really good. It's very good. And one of the things he says in the middle was, I was listening, but I didn't hear you. I thought that my view that globalization is going to help everybody, for example, was sort of unquestionable, and I didn't think I needed to necessarily understand your perspective on it. <clears throat> and he goes through in a very nice way how we need to actually sort of listen to each other. Um, then through a, a couple other conversations, I ended up watching uh, a TEDx talk by the author of the documentary, The Red Pill, um, a woman named Cassie J. Um, and I hadn't really heard of the Red Pill movement. I'd heard of the men's movement and men's rights advocates, or otherwise known as MRAs. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's pretty controversial, and it's, it's interesting. And Cassie J basically reports in her talk how she spent a year creating this documentary because she wanted to go look at the Red Pill movement, which uh, is ob an obvious uh, uh, sort of quote to uh, The Matrix, and do you want to take the Red Pill or the Blue Pill? And there's a whole bunch of people who are like taking the red pill figuratively and diving down uh, into, into this men's movement. Um, and what she discovered, she says, um, in the middle of it, she had to transcribe all of her hours of interviewing. And she says, uh, nobody will pay more attention to your words than somebody who has to transcribe faithfully what you said. <clears throat> and only when she was doing the transcription did she realize that she had been busy <clears throat> projecting onto her interviewees what she was assuming they were saying, what she needed them to say, what she was looking to say with her documentary. And at the end of it, and to the horror of a lot of people um, out speaking in the world, um, she realized that they weren't saying what she was assuming they were saying, that they were bringing up some interesting and valid issues. You can listen to her talk to sort of enumerate them, and she does a, a really good job of enumerating um, the kinds of questions that were brought up. And then that took me over through a couple other conversations to listen to an interview with Jordan Peterson, who is a, a controversial psychologist at the University of Toronto, whose name first came up for me when I put the Patreon campaign up and uh, went to look at uh, Graftrion to see who, who was doing well on Patreon. And it turns out that Jordan Peterson is making, was making at the time $43,000 a month from donations on Patreon, which is pretty damn good, right? <clears throat> well, what's up there? And so 
I'm skipping a couple things in between, but there's an interview you can see online of him and a woman reporter for a TV station, um, which is which is an encapsulation of the divide and the difficulty of this conversation. So the reason I'm bringing it up is that it's one of many examples that we could go to for how to reach out to the other and what this might, what well, this particular interview is an example of what it ought not look like. Because through the interview, uh, Peterson, who normally is a little a little too smug for my taste and who, who I have trouble kind of listening to on his own, but he is calm and busy sort of expressing himself through the interview. And the interviewer, every time she says, so what you're saying is dot, 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 the part that follows is always wrong. Like, like the moment she says, so what you're saying is then, you're like, uh, even watching the thing, you're like, no, he didn't really say that. He's, and then he defends himself really nicely. He's basically, this is a bit like a, a fencing match. And he, he parries her thrusts and then replies pretty calmly, no, how about this, how about that? And, and the whole thing is fraught because uh, relationships between genders are fraught, relationships between people of different races are fraught. Um, the very ability to have dialogue is in danger because um, tolerance has been weaponized in different ways. So we're, we're, we're in, a, in a world where these things are hard to say and do. Um, and so that, that has me both very sort of engaged, very drawn in to what's happening, trying to pay attention to the dynamics of it because it's fruitful dialogue between people who normally wouldn't talk or would be driven you know, away from each other. Um, and I think there's something really interesting um, in the middle there. And that, that was sort of longer than I, I wanted to uh, express that. And then, um, and then a, a last thing is by way of check-in is in January, I went back to the dojo and I'm, I've been back in Aikido class, which I did 10 years ago. I took Aikido for a couple of years in Berkeley, uh, enjoyed it a lot, and then moved into the city and just didn't re re really reconnect with it. And there's a dojo two blocks from home here in Portland which happens to have uh, ancestry back to the dojo that I used to go to in, um, in Berkeley. And so I have found it really centering and I've found it metaphorically incredibly useful because Aikido, as you've probably heard in talks or whatever, is all about blending with the energy that's present in the world. Uh, normally an attacker tries to do something to you and you sort of blend with them and neutralize them or you know, direct them somewhere else. And that seems like a bit of a recipe for social change and for, for crafting uh, different kinds of things. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, how that fits uh, with the other pieces of it. But it, um, another thing that Aikido gives you is a sense of calm in the whirlwind of action. And I was feeling that last night because I went and worked out at, at six o'clock last night and was doing all right. It was a good day in the, in the dojo. And in the you're you're doing something that's a little bit complicated and looks pretty you know whoosh 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 and yet you know where to look and you know what to pay attention to and you're sort of in the moment in a different way than you would be if you didn't have that training or that frame of mind and so how is the work you know katie byron's the work like that how, how what are the fruitful sources for this kind of work that gives you some calm and some perspective for each of us and how might we um, share those and, and work on those. So, long check-in. Sorry, I probably should have paused between the chapters. Uh, Kevin, we can't hear you for some reason. You're unmuted, but but the there police we go. are coming after you. I, I oh, heard oh. them in the back. <laughs> it's not, it's someone, someone else's mic because there's the the police is not actually here. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're, you're you're going through. You're taking good advantage of the uh, you know, the, the turmoil to uh, make some positive changes. That's good. I like what you said earlier, Kevin. Very much. It's 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 a very it's a broken moment, but when you know when things break is when change happens. Absolutely. Anytime you're going through a phase change, either from survival to success or realizing that success isn't enough and you're going from success to significance is an opportunity to do a maximal change moment. Anytime you go through a phase change. And we kind of celebrate people who go from success to failure back to success again. We like that narrative, right? Of, oh, you know, um, made it back. And I think that there are people who, um, 
have been nominally successful for a long time that try to pursue significance and fail, they fall back in success and they try that again, right? That's a less known narrative, but it's equally heroic, right, in terms of trying to, you know, move out of, you know, the, uh, the complacency that's associated with merely being uh, successful by a lower set of, you know, of, uh, you know, ground rules. So, all right. Yeah. yeah. I, I sent you a model. I got to go, but uh, to help support your, uh, your upcoming talk. So take a look at it. I, I couldn't put it in the chat folks, but i am sent it to you, Jerry. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Kevin. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for being here. Jerry, is a comment on your focus that, that threads um, ask story about, threaders? Right, story threaders. We, we try to collect stories. In other words, that's sort of like a function of ours with our, the charities that we work with and everything. And one of, one of the challenging things to me that you could just have in the back of your mind is the degree to which you focus on creating safety in order to get improved outcomes. In other words, I find that even within our Center for Social Change, where there is no pressure to do this, that, or the other thing, people come into the, the center, in other words, their own background, with such pressure to perform, to, to do well, to prove that they're worth something, that they, they create their own stress. And in a way, getting people to back off of that, in other words, feel that the environment, the ground that they're on is safe, so that they can try different things, not worry about, quote, failure. You know, okay, if it didn't work, try something else. That, that is, it's, it's such a conundrum because even that sort of going from success to failure and back to success, there, we, we sort of assume that somehow people just step up. In other words, that, they, that they, their own internal motivation structure, et cetera, is enough. You know, that they don't need a supporting environment that enables that. And that, that's why I sort of dig into things like the scientific, the scientific education of love, where they're saying that that safety, that, that, that inherent feeling of lack of safety starts at birth. You know, and, and, and it's almost like you, it's very difficult to extract that. And, and my only point is there, I'm, I'm not trying to preach for safety because obviously if everybody's safe, nothing happens. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's got to be some level of focus on that, some level of response. There was the relationship aspect, the willingness to, to, to look out for the other. In essence, you, know, you read the, the Empathic Civilization by Jeremy Rifkin, 2,000 years of consistent increase in the capacity to care for the other. In other words, you've got the structures, you've got the energy, you've got the systems, et cetera, et cetera. And in essence, I think that our, our systems are challenged right now because they've been too individuated. In other words, too much responding to Ayn Rand, and it's all about me, you know, and I want mine. The 1% wants to make more and more and more and crowd everybody else out of the, the equation. And I'm not trying to make that wrong. I'm just saying that they're doing an excellent job of showing how good they can be. Mm -hmm. but well, the, the American dream is built on rugged individualism. It's one right. of the pil one of the pillars of the American dream is <clears throat> is this notion of individualism. It was very we are the uh, the apex civilization of that thought. Right. And and look how much violence and crime and and problems at the top and the bottom that we create as a result of that. And, and right. so that's what makes it even more of a challenge to try and post safety. In other words, an environment within which people can emerge as a nicer, more, in other words, exactly what you're asking. How can we care about the other? Well, you're not going to care about the other unless you're okay. Um, it's interesting that what you say about safety, because I'm, I'm trying to puzzle through, what that balance is, because I think safety is really essential. I think that, that you know, um, fear basically shuts down our brains. We, we, we have fewer mental options. We're less creative. We go fewer places. <clears throat> and yet pressure of some sort 
um, leads to creativity, leads to innovation, leads to results in different ways. I, I remember being in a meeting. <clears throat> so I, I knew Eric Greenberg, who founded Scient, when he, uh, before he actually had staff, he had uh, $8 million from Benchmark and a 33-page PowerPoint deck. And I, I helped him in, the, in those early days shape their first pitch deck, et cetera, et cetera. And I learned a little bit later that he was an NLP master, basically. And, and he used that on the small team that was in a conference room shaping their pitch deck. He would come in and, and uh, like there was a kind of pressure he applied. And I don't, I, don't, I don't know that he was a master of safety in any way whatsoever, but I, I didn't feel like my future was threatened. But he had a way of applying pressure that where really interesting things popped out of us that showed up in the pitch deck that were there because he had done some unreasonable sort of thing uh, requiring some kind of pressure. And then to put a darker spin on this, um, one of my theories is that unresolved childhood trauma is the source of most human art and creativity. If you go read the biographies of Sylvia Plath and Rothko and, and whoever, just go, just, just go down the list of, of our famous artists and creators, the, the, the vast preponderance of them are basically working at sorting out demons in their lives and that that creates um, some kind of extra creativity and that those people never found safety or satisfaction, many of them. Uh, they, they suffered through their lives and, and yet made great works. So, oh, okay, um, but just to, just to reinforce what you're saying, I, yeah. I was watching a video uh, on YouTube by Tim Ferriss, the guy that wrote yeah. right, the, the Four Hour Body and all that kind of stuff. And he tells a story of not too long ago, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, where he was literally on the verge of committing suicide. And he ended up not committing suicide, obviously, but, but used his concerns to create something that he calls fear setting, which sounds very similar to what you're talking about in terms of using that, that pressure that the unresolved conflicts of childhood, et cetera, does, but, but in a constructive way. In other words, so that when, when I talk about safety, in his mind, safety comes from accepting the fear Hmm. But knowing you can handle it. Yeah. You know, and, and in essence, he comes up with a, a, literally like a three-page, do this, do this, do this, and you're, you're okay. In fact, I'll, I'll email it to you so you can post it and everything. I, I, I sat down and typed out his prescription because I want to use it. Cool. Um, but, but it's that, that balance between, I mean, you can be in fear. You can have all the childhood traumas. But if you use it with a sense that you're safe in it, I think when we were discussing trust and everything, the, uh, the, the, the original book, Trust, basically says that the, the lack of trust comes from you not trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so very that's self-referential. Paris is getting, getting at. In other words, that you've got to create a sense that you can trust yourself to keep yourself safe. Love that. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we've come to the top of our time, and um, I'm just wondering if anybody would like to throw anything into our conversation by way of wrap-up or taking us out. Uh, Peter, I, I would like to have a, ch a chat uh, offline with you on the uh, story weavers, etc. Sounds great. Because what you seem to describe is um, a technique of listening carefully. And I think um, uh, uh, instead of thinking about registering content like a scriber, yeah, I think it's um, an interesting perspective to try to offer a risky perspective. I wrote something about it recently, and I used the word fear, but in a completely different context. I, I, I just stumbled upon another acronym, a fear, A F E E R. And um, the A stands for advancement, and the F stands for fun, and the E stands for edgy. and the other A, um, I think it has something to do with, with uh, alertness. Energy? Alertness. And the last one, the R, is risky. 
So that was a reflection of what is interesting work or what are interesting ways of listening or interesting ways of registering. They may have those, uh, those attributes. And so I have been reflecting a lot on how can I help people create events or immersive learning experiences using these, um, these qualities. That's great. Yeah. There, there's this edge of, edge of chaos-ish uh, place that I think we can design for uh, that helps interesting things come out. And uh, part, partly my inspiration for the story threaders comes from frustration from being at too many meetings where at the beginning I hear really good sparky things show up. Then I watch a process that snuffs out all the little sparks. And then at the end, I'm like, well, I met some interesting new people and I'm going to put them in my Rolodex and stay in touch. And not much really happens. And I'm, I'm trying to fix for that. Um, so these are great uh, design uh, guidance ideas. So Peter, we'll, let, let's just set up a call for ourselves. Anybody else? If not, I will, um, let me reread one of our poems to go out, to take us back into our day. And this is uh, Ron Paget's For a Moment. It's funny how if you just let go of things, they will come to you. This is to say, sometimes. So what good is such a generalization? Uh, it makes you feel good to say such things from time to time as if you actually and really and truly knew something. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Really appreciate the check-ins. It's been fantastic.